see the clock. Would you have cataracts? Yeah, cataract surgery. I can see the clock. Wow. However, I, I can't see the music. Right. Oh, I know. You need to read this then. <laughs> I haven't worn my contacts for like three weeks, so I'm going to have a hard time if I get it out. Yeah. It's annoying, but it's... for this morning. Uh, Wednesday is turkey cooking day. Wednesdays? No. 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 Wednesday is turkey packing day. Turkey packing day. That's right. We have two 20 pound turkeys that are, go that are going to get cooked uh, and then we're going to be packing them on Wednesdays. Yeehaw. Gobble gobble. Any other announcements? Then let us center ourselves for worship. Will you please rise if you are able and join me in the call to worship. In the midst of life's storms, God is there. We have nothing to fear. God's love for us is great. God we reach out in healing and patience. All praise to God the Father. Will you please join Connie and Marge in our opening hymn, Be Still My Soul, found in your hymnal, number 534.
please join me in the opening prayer. Holy God, we extol and honor you for who you are. We praise you for your faithfulness and for your tender mercies that are renewed every morning. We exalt you, Sovereign One, for every blessing of yesterday, the gift of this day, and the promises of our tomorrows. Grant us an enduring faith as we strive against oppression and despair. Endow us with contagious joy that uplifts the downtrodden and inspires hope in you. Increase in us the faith and courage of the prophets, the love of Jesus, and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. In your majestic name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, and can be found in the insert in your bulletin. As we work together with him, we entreat you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. Look, now is the acceptable time. Look, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacles in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, in great endurance, afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, impurity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of the Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying, and look, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Also with you. Let us now offer one another a sign of peace. Now is the time for our sharing of joys and concerns. Does anyone have any joys that they wish to share? We are so happy that Marjorie, I can't believe it, but Marjorie has recovered almost from her, um, her surgery, no, from her uh, cataract surgery, and uh, came in raring to play. Yeah. 
Yeah, she can see the clock. <laughs> Other joys? Yeah, well, what was amazing inside of a factory, too. Oh, that's <laughs> rad. And I do not wear junky clothes to work, so it was spiffy. Oh. Lots of laundry. Other joys? Uh, my friend Carol Smith uh, is recovering smoothly from a terrible surgery and uh, is now in rehab. Chase and rehab. Still has a long way to go, but she's making progress. Excellent. Leading on her own. Other joys. <laughs> mm. How about concerns? Everyone, uh, pray for my niece. She and her husband are are trying to adopt. They've been wanting children, and they were matched with a with a, a woman in Utah. But you know they go to an agency, and very expensive. And the woman likes Jennifer. And, you know she thinks she'd be the ideal. Yeah. But all of a sudden, she's getting the lawyer called and said the woman's unhappy with the agency. I mean, there's just a lot of stress involved in this oh, adoption process. And, it's, it's, and, you know, they just want to be parents, and, right. and it's, it's very stressful. It's very for Jennifer and Danny. It's funny because I have, a, I have a friend, and they could not have children. So they adopted two children. And when the children were nine and four, she got pregnant. Oh. That's what we're hoping for, Jeff. Maybe with all the stress, you know, maybe when she adopted one, maybe another one. You never know. Other concerns. Something ate all the cute cucumbers I planted, oh. and a couple of hot peppers. So I'm going to switch to root vegetables in that spot because I give up. Just an update, kind of a joy, that Sharon Arnold wrote back to Carol and I that Dick did very well with his um, hip surgery and uh, is progressing well. And thanked us all for our prayers. Other concerns? My concern is for my family, which is traveling back to North Carolina tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That would be David and Michaela and Michelle, Stella the dog, Muffin the bunny, and Noah Robert the grandson. <laughs> Do your father-in-law have a uh, birthday? He had a birthday, yes he did, a 90th birthday, but no birthday party. Oh. And we called around for um, a life celebration service up there. He wanted to do it at Mount Pocono United Methodist Church. Uh -huh. Families are great. <laughs> anyway, the only date where the minister that he wanted, which is Kofi Ashley, who, who was their minister when they went to Mount Pocono, um, and the church lined up was, was August 3rd. So we set August 3rd as the time for the life celebration. And all of a sudden, it has morphed into, we can combine it with a party for Pop Pop. And my wife is seeing red because she's doing all the arrangements, all the organizing. So she made several phone calls. And did I ever tell you that when she worked at Lockheed Martin, her nickname was Give Em Hell Michelle? <laughs> there 
If you wanted to see evidence of that, it certainly came back. Thank you for asking. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful that Marjorie is able to see the clock and that she recovered from her cataract surgery. And we're grateful for the opportunity to spend time doing fun things like, like going to the beach and being with family. And we're grateful for, for the efforts that, of the doctors and nurses and for the recovery of Carol Smith. Not our Carol Smith, but a Carol Smith. And we pray today for Michael's niece, Jennifer, as they are trying to adopt, trying to have a family, trying to fulfill the things that you have told us. And we pray today for all those people that work in gardens and have pests come and eat of their vegetables. We pray that they maintain because gardeners are a special breed. And we pray today for Dick Arnold, we are grateful that he's recovering from hip surgery and pray that he continues his rehabilitation and returns whole. And we pray for all those who will be traveling, traveling tomorrow, especially for my family, traveling back to North Carolina. We ask you to keep them safe on their journey. And now, as the congregation names the names of the people that are on their heart, we will respond with, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. <coughs> Tammy and Rob. Lord, hear our prayer. Dick and Ruth. Lord, hear our prayer. <clears throat> hear these prayers, O Lord, and the prayers for the people that are on our heart that we did not name, and we praise you and worship you by reciting the words that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join Connie and our newly, new, our organist with new eyes, Marge. One new eye. One new eye. In our next, next hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow, Found in the Faith We Sing, 2146.
Our Gospel reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, and can be found in the insert in your bulletin. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. <coughs> but he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Well, good morning again. Good morning. And if I read these exactly as I wrote them, I would say, Moo name is Bob Irving. <laughs> My name is Bob Irving, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve as the pastor here at Solberry United Methodist Church. And as I read this gospel message, two things came to mind. Expectations and routines. Humans are odd. Some of us are odder than others. But we build expectations based on our experiences throughout the course of our lives. Here is an example. When you turn on the faucet, what happens? Water comes out. What would happen if it did not? You turn the key in your car and nothing happens. You turn on your air conditioner and there is no cold air. Simple, small problems that do not meet our expectations. And these are just small things. What about big things? Did you know there were 24 successful space shuttle missions into orbit prior to the Challenger disaster? Did you know that of the 24 successful space missions into orbit, Nine of them were in the Space Shuttle Challenger. No one expected the explosion. The launches themselves had actually become sort of ho-hum. I actually recall being in Punta Gorda one year, and there was a launch. And you cannot see the launch until it rises up into the sky, and then you see this bright flame going up and up and up and up. And the same was true for the moon landings, until, of course, Apollo 13. When you board a plane, do you accept a, expect a panel to fly off? Or like Air Hawaii, do you expect half of the roof to be ripped away? Of course, all of our expectations are not always based on reality. <coughs> or on major things. For example, our expectations fluctuate. Here's an example. You make a dinner reservation. Do you really expect to be seated when you show up for your reservation? Or do you expect to have to wait because we're cleaning up the table now? The tendency of humans to develop expectations is not just limited to things that occur in our lives. We also develop expectations of people and outcomes. Have you ever shared an idea or belief with someone? And after they responded, you said, I knew you would say that. The Lord be with you. And also with you. There you go. I knew you would say that. <laughs> See what I mean? <clears throat> and even if you didn't say it, I bet you thought it. 
So if you're wondering what this has to do with the gospel this morning, hang around. Maybe we'll get to it. Maybe we won't. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for allowing us to gather as your people to study your word. May our understanding be increased and our faith be strengthened. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you've been following along or attending, we've been in Mark for a little while, and Jesus has been teaching. He's been preaching in parables. He's been explaining things to his disciples. <coughs> He's healed people. Some of the parables, as you would call the, the scattering of seed or the, the mustard seed that grows into a great bush. And a great crowd is formed and is following him because of his teachings and because of his actions. As a matter of fact, he has spent time in Capernaum where he spent a long time, all night, healing people that came to him that were sick. And on this gospel message today, evening had come. And he wants to go to the other side. They don't tell you, is he trying to get away from the crowd? They don't tell you if there's some important mission for him to go on on the other side. However, I've read ahead so I know what's going on on the other side. We don't know. And the disciples don't know. But think about this. They're leaving in the evening. It's a good thing that they have radar-equipped boats. Oh, wait. Well, at least they have powerful lights so they can see what's going on. Or a well-lit shoreline so they can always keep an eye on where the shore is. And there's always the Coast Guard in case there's any trouble. You see, the disciples are experienced in boats. As you'll recall, many of the disciples, who are not yet called disciples, they are called them. They have experience in boats because they're fishermen. And they fish early in the morning before sunrise, which is really one of the best times to fish, or late at night, or not late at night, but just after sunset, which is another great time to fish. So they know the sea, they know the lake, but here's the thing, if you read any historical accounts, these small boats were rarely further than 300 feet away from the shore. That's the length of a football field. Sometimes they go out a little deeper, but not often. In case the boat capsized, they would have the ability to swim back to shore. And these boats are not like the boats that we have. These boats had very low sides. As a matter of fact, the sides of the boat were probably as high as this stage, maybe a little bit higher. Do you think a wave would be able to overcome the top of that? And they were hollow on the inside. They didn't have any nice sleek decks that were covered with fiberglass so that any water that came over would just run off. It was not uncommon for them to take in water. And of course they had this great sophisticated pump system which was <coughs> Grab anything that holds water, scoop it up and throw it overboard. Scoop it up and throw it overboard. <clears throat> and then a great windstorm comes. Now, if you know anything about the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee is actually surrounded by gently sloping hills which actually lead to these very steep, cl very steep cliffs. Sorry. The wind comes over the cliffs, follows straight down the hillside, and right across the water. <coughs> it comes at very odd times, you never know when. It most likely comes in the evening. So as this great storm comes, as the wind comes, naturally it kicks up the waves. And the waves come over the side of the boat. Now, at this point in Mark, Jesus has already performed five healings and demon exorcisms. He has already stated to the elders of Israel that he is Lord of the Sabbath. He has already forgiven people's sins and has been called a blasphemer for doing it. Yet, 
the disciples are fearful when he does what he does. And actually that Greek word that they use for fearful means two things. It means fear, but it also means awe. So, what does this mean for us? Well, it's interesting that they are afraid after he calms the wind and the sea. It's interesting to me because whenever there is some sort of supernatural experience, like an angel comes down, what do the angels say? Do not be afraid. And all the text does not say this, the Greek word that he uses for why are you afraid actually translate into why are you cowards? Cowards used to have a whole lot deeper meaning. <coughs> to be a coward was one of the ultimate shames for people. See, have you no faith? They saw what he could do. They heard what he said. They left their lives to follow him. They left family. They left vocation. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever taken a cruise? Can you imagine being on a cruise ship and a storm pops up? Now, cruise ships are huge. And generally, they can handle the storm, although it does feel rough to the people that are on the boat. Can you imagine it popping up and some guy walks out on deck and says, be still. And all of a sudden the waves stop. What would you think? Would you be afraid? I know my office mates would think the guy was a wizard. But then they play these stupid Dungeon and Dragon games online with groups of people. So what is our level of faith? You know, because here's the thing. Very faithful people have had horrible things happen to them. And I think one of the things that we forget about is we think of we think of God's interventions in our lives and our faith as sort of like a menu. One from column A, one from column B. Oh, my son is sick. Please heal my son. But that's not what faith is. Faith is not about rescue. Faith is not about getting things that you want. Faith is not even about this mortal world at all. That's why we have that saying, Thy will be done. I mean, let's face it. If it was totally up to Bob, my dad would be healthy and alive. My mom would be healthy and alive. My kids would live close to me, but not that close, just close enough. Faith is belief that eventually everything will be okay, even in death. Everything will be okay. Did I not tell you that my father has many rooms and that I would come back and take you to them so that you would be with me? You see, if you think about Jesus, Jesus is God. God made this creation. So it makes sense that he could control any aspect of this creation. But is that his purpose? And is that what he does? And in doing what he did, why do you think he did it? Why didn't he just say, okay, and make them appear on the shore? Because he could have done that. It was just another example of his ability and his power so that their faith in him and what he is talking about and what he is doing would become deeper and less questioning. Thank God for Peter, who questioned almost everything. I mean, if you think about this, we have a lot of atheists in this world. 
God could make everyone a believer. Why doesn't he? God could make you a non-believer. Like if he didn't like you. You know, we'll make them a non-believer. We'll see what happens to them at Judgment Day. <clears throat> God could cause another 40-day and 40-night flood. <coughs> Incidentally, you do know that there is lots of historical evidence for a great flood around the time when the Bible says it happened. And the interesting thing is that the flood waters were only minimally came from the sky. Most of them came from the earth. God could preordain everything that is happening, including the words that are coming out of my mouth. And you look at the disciples, they'd witnessed these things, and they were still overcome with fear because their expectation was being that far out in the water, in that small of a boat, when there is a storm, you drown. Very similar to our daily lives. Have you ever been caught in a riptide? Key thing, don't panic. If you panic, you lose. If you swim against it, you lose. <coughs> Excuse me. We believe and we get caught up in the drama of being mortals. We lose ourselves, or rather I should say, we lose our Christianity oftentimes. We are called to see that there is a huge gulf between two vastly different worlds. That's what happens when you're called to be a Christian. The kingdom world and the mortal world. We're supposed to have a foot in both. It's not easy. The line between these worlds is very thin. But in the middle of, these, this, of this line stands Jesus Christ. So no matter what, whether you believe or don't believe, no matter what, you have to have faith. Faith that in the end, Everything will be okay. In our little world, your life is that boat. And you've encountered storms that have risen out of nowhere. What do you do when the wind picks up and your boat starts to fill with water? Amen. Now is the time for our offering. There is a plate on the back table if you have an offering to give. Now is the time to get up and put it in the plate. When everyone is done, Wayne will bring it forward. We will sing the doxology number 94.
in the offering prayer? Gracious God, as we bring our offerings before you in this Pentecost season, we acknowledge the gift of your grace, freely given and then calling us to respond. Help us not to accept your grace in vain, but to let it bear fruit in our lives and in our communities. May our actions reflect the transforming power of your grace as we open our hearts to love, to vulnerability, and to relationship, trusting in the abundance of your grace to guide us. Amen. Our closing hymn, it looks like we're supposed to stand up for it. <laughs> stand up, stand up for Jesus. It's found in your hymnal, number 514.